It's a very familiar passage of scripture that we hear in the gospel. We hear of the revelation, for that's the only word that you can use for it. The revelation to Simon of the true identity of Jesus. The rest of the disciples do not share this very personal revelation and are uncertain about who he is, choosing at first to quote what others have suggested rather than either commit to themselves or appear ignorant. Then, when directly challenged by Jesus, who do you say I am? All voices seem to fall silent by one. One who dares to put into words the answer that God himself has placed in his mind. The foundation of the church had already been foretold when Jesus had previously made it clear that the kingdom of God had to be a visible sign, something present in the world. On this new occasion, however, he is far more explicit. He makes it clear, he makes clear some of the aspects or characteristics of the church as we found it. These include its foundation, its leadership and its permanence. Its foundation is faith. Faith in Christ Jesus, Son of the living God. This faith, we are told, does not come from any human thinking. It is not a matter of opinion or a merely sentimental attachment, as may sometimes be accused. It comes instead as a gift from God himself. Jesus chose his words extremely carefully when he says that the gift of faith to Simon is not from flesh and blood. This is an expression which Jews understand as describing the merely human, so that the meaning that the gift is superhuman would have been abundantly clear to everyone present. The leadership is to be focused, initially at least, on the person who now becomes known as Peter, the first to declare Christ's true nature. Simon becomes Cephas, the rock, known to us as Peter, it is on this sure foundation that the church is to be founded. Perhaps there's a reference here to the parable about houses being built on rock and not on sand. This arrangement is not to be a temporary one either. Never, we are told, never will the powers of death overcome it. Clearly then, the church is to outlive Peter, so whatever is given by Christ to him as its foundation must endure in the church and its leadership. And this is important understanding the continual authority of the church. Jesus goes on to tell Peter that he and the church is to lead is to be given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And it is implicit that this applies not just to Peter, but also to his successors. God has always, from Old Testament times onwards, wanted his people to have a clear, visible leader, and henceforth this is to be the leader of his church. In addition to this, Peter, or the church, have authority that what is considered bound or unbound on earth is likewise bound or unbound in heaven. In Jewish society, the expression to bind and unbind means to state what is forbidden and what is allowed. This means that what is often suggested that this directive is the source of the sacrament of reconciliation, and might in effect be the case, is also the source of the church's authority to set under the laws and regulations for Christian society. The keys of the kingdom thus give the authority, among other things, to absolve, but also to pronounce on doctrinal and disciplinary matters. The laws that are set down as a result of this process take precedent over the laws of human society as they come from the higher authority. And this has been the cause of tensions in church and state at many times in history. From the time of this passage, Peter is established as preeminent among the twelve apostles and his mission becomes unique. He is in due course to provide leadership and unity to his brothers and to the church, to guard the authentic teachings of Christ and to be the shepherd of the entire church. This role grows throughout the early history of the church. 
the presidents of the Bishop of Rome, as his role becomes known, that stood on an unbroken line to this day, known after him as the Petrine Ministry, the papal office itself. It would be grossly unfair when preaching on this solemnity, and I say something also about St Paul. And I find it interesting that whilst the Gospel tells us of the start of Peter's unique ministry, the reading of the second of the Timothy was the end of a ministry, a ministry in which there had clearly been much fulfilment. The doubts that may exist with the actual authorship of this letter do not detract from the fact that it records poor satisfaction of a job well done, his utter confidence in the reward in heaven. Despite early tensions between Paul's supporters and the fledgling church in Jerusalem, Paul accepted the authority of Peter, and his own ministry was supported and encouraged. Now this is coming to an end. His life and his own words poured out as a libation. Sometimes called the Apostle to the Pagans, Paul acknowledges that this is where his ministry lay, to share the good news of Christ Jesus throughout the world, or proclaim for all the pagans to hear in the words chosen in this letter. This is to fulfil Christ's final command to disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This was the commission of the church, and the ministry of St Paul showed the way in which it was and still needs to be carried out. Through a number of difficult journeys and numerous letters, some of which survive to be included in the epistles. Paul gives his life, like pagans aware of Christ, buoyed up by the faith in the Lord. Now he's imprisoned again, quite probably in Rome. We can see the end of life looming up, but, he, but we see no sign of any regret in this. He looks forward only to his place in the heavenly kingdom. The role of St Peter has been handed down throughout history and now rests in the hands of Pope Francis. The role of St Paul, however, rests not with one man, but with all Christians, as we accept the duty to share the good news with everyone. There are still plenty of pagans to go around, I can assure you. Either they may not probably choose to see themselves as by such a term as this. So go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, share with them the authentic teaching and the unity that is nurtured by the successor of Peter. And may God go with you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.